This is the reactivity series of metals. It's not every single metal that there is, but it's the most common ones. It tells you what metals are more reactive than other metals. and has very important implications for the real world, such as sacrificial metals, how do we actually extract metals from rocks, from ores, and also things like electrolysis as well. You'll see that we have carbon and hydrogen in there as well. They're not metals, but it is still very important that we know how reactive they are compared to metals. We're not just going to be talking about metals today, we're talking about non-metals as well. Let's look at the top four. We have potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium. So why is potassium more reactive than the other three? Well, in order to explain that, we need to go to our periodic table. Here's the left-hand side of our periodic table. If you haven't seen my bonding video, then you need to watch that first because I go into how the periodic table is arranged. If you have seen that, you'll remember that the numbers at the top of the periodic table are the group, and that tells you the number of electrons in the outer shell. So hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell because it's a single group one, as does lithium, sodium, and potassium. Beryllium and magnesium and calcium have two electrons in their outer shell. And we know that on the right-hand side of the periodic table, we also have other elements, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or zero, depending on which way you think about it. But now we need to think about not the columns, not the groups, but rather the rows. Columns are called group, but what row an element is in is called the period. What does the period tell you? Well, it tells you how many shells an element has. So let's look at hydrogen. We know that hydrogen is in group one and it's in period one, two, which means that it only has one shell and it has one electron in that shell. Lithium, well, it's in group one, but it's in period two, which means that it has two electron shells. We know that the outer shell must have one, but how many are on the inner shell? Well, we know electrons fill up in the form of 2882. If a First shell is full, it's going to have two. Second shell is full, it's going to have eight. So you what, let's draw sodium just for good measure. I think I need a little bit more room for this. We know it's in period three, so it's going to have three electron shells. Now usually we don't draw these, do we? Because we're only usually concerned with how many electrons are in the outer shell. But today we're looking at how many electrons are in all of these shells, or rather how many shells there are. So we said that it's not two in the second shell, but eight if it's full. And then it's in group one again, so we know we must have just one electron in the outer shell. All of these are in group one, but they are in different periods. So they have the same number of electrons in the outer shell, one, but that outer shell, importantly, is a different distance away from the nucleus at the center because you have the other shells in between. So we know that Every nucleus out there is positively charged because it's just protons and neutrons. That's why electrons don't go flying off, isn't it? Because they're attracted to the nucleus. You know that opposites attract. That goes for a lot of things in life, but especially when it comes to chemistry and physics. Positives will attract negatives and vice versa, just like poles of a magnet. North will attract south. Now, what does this have to do with reactivity? Well, what happens when one of these elements react. Well, we know that they want, as it were, we never say that, do we? But we can think it because, hey, when you want an ice cream, isn't that just the result of chemical reactions inside your brain? That's a philosophical question for another time. Anyway, in order to react, these atoms need to lose or give away or donate their outer electron. So they need to get rid of they want electron hydrogen. Well, it usually takes part in covalent bonding. So we're not going to say that it really gets rid of it. Sometimes it does kind of, but uh, we'll just talk about lithium and sodium for now. Now, out of lithium and sodium, which one is going to find it easier to get rid of its outer electron? And it's going to be sodium. So sodium, Na, is more reactive as it is able to donate its outer electron in order to get an empty shell or a full outer shell underneath it. Same thing, outer electron. And why is this? That's because it's further from the nucleus. So what does that mean? We can say to be posh, the electrostatic force, you've heard of static electricity, that's how things attract and repel each other, same thing, because the electrostatic force is less. It's like when you have two magnets, if they're really close to each other, you have to put in more energy to get those magnets apart compared to if those magnets were further apart already. 
And we can talk about it in terms of energy as well. We can say that less energy is needed to remove it. So we said that something like fluorine can come along. Fluorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. It wants one more electron. So where's it gonna get it from? Lithium or sodium? Well, it's gonna find it easier. It's gonna use less energy to take it from the sodium because that outer electron is further away from the nucleus. And so the same goes for beryllium, magnesium, and calcium in group two as well. Calcium's two outer electrons are further away from the nucleus than magnesium's. Magnesium's are further away than beryllium. So we can say that for group one and two, as we go down the group, they get more reactive. And so, yeah, we haven't talked about rubidium and strontium and cesium. Well, they're so reactive because their outer electrons are so far away from the nucleus that, well, we can't really keep them around for very long without them reacting with something else. You have to keep them encased in oil so they don't really react with anything. And if you put it in water, you'd end up with a pretty hefty explosion because the reaction would be so violent because they're so reactive. Let's look at the other side. Let's look at group six and seven. So let's write down the periods again. So let's look at group seven, shall we? Let's look at the, well, we call them the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Yeah, maybe acetine as well, but usually we look at the first four. So let's draw fluorine, shall we? We know it's in group seven, but it's in period two. So therefore it has to have two shells. So we have one, two, as per usual, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's fluorine. It's in group seven. It has seven electrons on this outer shell. Let's draw chlorine. It's in group three. So three shells. It's in period three, so three shells. One, two in the first shell. Eight in the second shell. One, two, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then again, seven in the outer shell. Let's leave the empty space down there. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to pop an electron on to here in order for it to have a full outer shell of eight. It needs that one extra electron, and we know it can get that from a metal. So the question is then, which one of these is more reactive? Well, again, we can think about it like two magnets. Here we have two magnets that we're going to put together that are quite close together because the outer shell is quite close to the nucleus. But here we have and fairly far apart. Let's put my poles on there as well. So we know that they're gonna be attracted to each other, but which pair of magnets is gonna find it easier to join together? That's gonna to be these ones here. Because they're closer together, they're going to come together more readily. They're gonna find it easier to join together. And it's the same thing with our atoms. Fluorine is more reactive as its outer shell is closer to the nucleus. So therefore, if an electron comes along and it sees a fluorine and it sees a chlorine and it's as far away from both of them, well, it's gonna go for the fluorine because it's like, hey, this outer shell is closer to the nucleus. I'm attracted to the nucleus because I'm negative and the nucleus is positive. So fluorine is more reactive as this outer shell is closer to the nucleus, meaning the electrostatic force from the nucleus is greater. It's easier for it to gain that extra electron. So what happens with the reactivity for the halogens, group seven and group six for that matter, is the opposite of what it is for group one. They actually get more reactive as you go up the group because they're not looking to get rid of an electron, they're looking to gain an electron. And it's much easier to gain an electron if it's going to slip in into an outer shell that's closer to the nucleus. So there you go. Now you know how reactivity changes as you go up or down groups one, two, and six, and seven. We don't really talk about reactivity with groups three, four, and five because it's not really that useful. So more often than not, you'll see it applied to these four groups. So what does this mean for us then? Well, it means that we can have displacement reactions. That is when a more reactive element kicks out a less reactive one from a compound. So let's say that we have sodium chloride. And what happens if we react it with potassium? 
Well, we know that potassium is further down group one, so therefore it's more reactive. So therefore, it's going to kick out the sodium. It's a bit of a bully. It comes along and says, no, that chlorine is mine. And it's because it's, well, we can say that it's energetically favorable if we want to be super posh about it. Well, the chlorine basically goes, I can keep the electron from the sodium or, well, actually, it's much easier to get the electron from the potassium instead. And so it jumps ship, as it were. Talk more about ships in a minute. So therefore, it turns into potassium chloride and sodium is left out in the cold. F's in chat. So that can happen with metals, but it can also happen with non-metals as well. Let's say that we have calcium iodide. That's CaI2 because, well, calcium needs to give away two electrons and each iodine needs one. But then we're reacting it with chlorine, Cl2. Let's have a look at group seven. We can see that chlorine is higher up group seven, higher up the halogens than iodine. Therefore, it's more reactive. So it's going to kick out the iodine. So we're left with calcium chloride and this time the iodine is left out in the cold rip there's a million different types of displacement reactions you can get like this so let's have a look at the reactivity series of lots of metals here we go you don't need to explain why potassium is more reactive than calcium because they're in a different group so don't worry too much about that this is a reactivity series that uh, you will be given or well, you might have to learn it, but probably not. Another thing we can use this idea for is sacrificial metals. So let's say that you have a boat. Uh, what does a boat look like? Sure, why not? Let's say it's a gunboat. Beautiful. Now, boats are made out of steel, and steel has iron in it, so Fe is in it. Now, you know that when iron is in water, it will rust. It will react and turn into iron oxide. Not good. So what can we do? Well, what we do is pop all over the hull of the ship, keel of the ship, we might say the bits that are underwater, put on there strips of zinc. Now have a look at the reactivity series. We can see that zinc is more reactive than iron. So when the water comes along, comes along to the keel of the ship, it goes, I could react with the iron or zinc, but well, zinc's more reactive. Therefore, I'm going to react with that first. So the water will react with the zinc first and it will corrode the zinc before it will start corroding the metal. That's the idea anyway. We also put zinc around metals above ground as well. We call that galvanizing. And so uh, that will protect the iron underneath from rusting for a while at least anyway. We can also see carbon is in there as well. And so, well, that's important for when we extract metals from ore. So metal is found in the ground, but it's not by itself. You don't usually find lumps of metal. It's in a compound that we then have to extract it from. Here we have iron oxide. Iron oxide is what you find in your rocks. That's what you find in iron ore. So we need to get the iron out. So what we do is react it with carbon you might see this called coke. It's effectively coal. Now, what can we see in the reactivity series? Carbon is more reactive than iron. What do we know carbon will do? It will displace the iron from the compound. It will kick it out. And so what we're left with is iron by itself. Then the oxygens left over make carbon dioxide. But the important thing is that we've got pure iron out of this reaction. Isn't that clever? And a similar thing happens with aluminium oxide, which is found in aluminium ore. So why on earth is hydrogen in there? Well, that's important for when it comes to electrolysis. Now, if you haven't seen my electrolysis video, go watch that first. So let's say that in here we have uh, salt water, salt solution. So we have Na pluses swimming around, Cl minuses, H plus and OH minus. Because the compounds partially dissociate, we say, it's partially split up into ions. So we have two electrodes, positive and a negative electrode. And we know, well, this is the positive one, this is the negative one, so the anode and the cathode. We know that one substance is going to be created at the anode, one substance is going to be created at the cathode. We know that negative ions are going to be attracted to the anode, the positive electrode, and the positive ions are going to be attracted to the negative electrode, that is the cathode. So you might know that, well, it's the chlorine that goes across to here and we end up with 
just bubbles of chlorine gas being produced. But let's look at the other side. What's going to be produced at the cathode, at the negative electrode? Is it going to be sodium or is it going to be hydrogen? It's hydrogen gas. But why is that? Well, that's because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen, as we can see from our reactivity series. So we can say the more reactive ion stays in solution. And so that means the less reactive ion goes to the electrodes and then it gets turned back into a pure substance. If you want to see what happens the other way around, well, we could have copper sulfate solution. So we'd have Cu2+, plus, SO4, 2 minus, that's the sulfate ions. Then we have H+, plus, and we have OH-. Minus. Now what happens with the anode is that it's actually oxygen that ends up being produced, and that's because of the OH ions going to there. We're not too concerned about that. We're more concerned with the positive ions here, the cations. What's going to be formed at the cathode? Is it going to be copper? Or is it going to be hydrogen gas? Up above, we can see that it's hydrogen gas that was made. But actually, this time around, we end up with copper being built up around the cathode, around the negative electrode. Why is that? Look at the reactivity series. We can see that copper is less reactive than hydrogen. Hydrogen is more reactive than copper. Therefore, it stays in solution. And so therefore, it's the copper that gets kicked out of the solution. So actually what we're left with is H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. So there we go. That's the reactivity of elements as you go down groups one, two, six, and seven, the reactivity series for metals and what that means for various situations. Hope you found this helpful. If you did, please leave a like and leave a comment down below if you have any ideas of what I could do next. See you next time.